Shalom, and welcome to you all from the Mount of Remembrance in Jerusalem. My name is Yossi Gvir, and I'm Director of External and Governmental Affairs at Yad Vashem, the World Holocaust Remembrance Center. I'm honored to moderate today's special panel focusing on Muslims who rescued Jews during the Holocaust. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone to please mute themselves in order to ensure that we can hear our panelists well. I am now honored to invite His Excellency, Mr. Kiryako Kirko, Ambassador of the Republic of Albania to the United Kingdom to deliver an opening greeting. Mr. Ambassador, please. Thank you very much, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm deeply honored being here today with you, representing the people of Albania and my government. I'm proud to be here today because the history of protection of Jewish population in Albania is exceptional, an excellent example of humanity and the lesson, lesson for future generations. The relation between Albania and the Jewish communities are centuries old. Archaeological evidence suggests that Jewish presence since the first century AD. In the south of Albania, we can find the ruins of the old synagogue of the, in the Balkan region. The Jewish community, much like that other community present in Albania, has never com uh, considered foreigner, although the number of the people have never been of considerable amount. They have always been respected in the communities where they have dwelt, prized for their model of living, as well as the wisdom that characterized them. The ambassador of the United States, who served in Albania from 1930 to 1934, Mr. Herman Bernstein, wrote, there is no trace of discrimination against the Jewish population in Albanian history. Albanian happen to be one of the rare land in Europe today where the religion prejudices and hate do not exist. The Holocaust, unfortunately, is the darkest chapter in the modern history. At the end of World War II, the world experienced macabre carnages. Six million Jews were exterminated in concentration camps during the systematic and inhuman persecutions. Albanians chose not to stay indifferent during the unprecedented atrocities of Holocaust. They chose the right side, the side of life. But what made Albanians different from the rest of Europe in regards to the protection of Jewish population? What was to put their own lives at risk, jeopardize the life of their children and relatives? Meanwhile, others turned their back on them, closed their homes, on even worse, turn information to the Nazis of the whereabouts of their hidings, the way becoming, this way becoming accomplice of the tragedy of the Jewish population. Why it is that the number of Jewish people of the, after the war was 10 times bigger than before the war? Why, according to Yad Vashem account, there is no single case of Jewish person being handed to the Nazis authority by the Albanians? There are some who attempt to give the religion answer to this question. This hypothesis is refuted by the fact that Jewish population were welcomed in the homes of Albanian belonging to the Muslim religion as well as Christian Catholic and Christian Orthodox. There is also an interesting historic fact that explains the lack of religion affinity to the protection of Jewish population in Albania. In 1943, Hermann Nobacher, a leading Nazi stationate in Albania, shown the representative of all the religions community in Albania. And he, he demanded from them the list of the Jewish people they were hiding as well the Albanian gold. They handed over their own gold, but not the list of the Jewish people. There is only one explanation to this occurrence. Albanian tradition. To an Albanian, a foreigner is not an outsider, but a guest. An honorable host must make themselves available when the guest is in time of need. 
in the time of need, what was perhaps more necessary than ever was trust. Albanian, we have a special word for trust, one that is not to be found in the English dictionary, besa. This special word is the not only centuries old written in the medieval codes of honor and passed down through generation, but it is also in our DNA. Besa means many things, trust, faith, honoring one's promises, keeping one's words. When the Albanians give their besa to the Jewish people, they gave it with a feeling of an uncompromised protection for their guests, even if that meant fort fighting their own life. Amber Snow to them, the Albanian people from the past can teach us today a lesson or two of tolerance, understanding, brotherhood, and coexistence. When the time were all, they stretched their hand and to help the Jewish community. They opened the doors of their homes and they opened their hearts to these people. This was not the case in any other country in Europe. These people were going out for the way to help the foreigner without once asking, why am I sacrificing my, my resources and helping someone who is not from this country? Why should I list, risk my life to save someone who does not believe in the same religion as I do? The contribution of my fellow Albanian will be find the price and gratitude of the authority of the state of Israel. As a young diplomat in 1994, I have the distinctive honor of being part of the delegation to meet then foreign minister, Nobel Prize winner, Shimo Peres. On his welcome speech, among other things, he said, being a small or large, or large country is not measured by the extent of the territory, nor by the number of the population, but by the country values and the education of the society. I thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador. And now let's meet our distinguished panel for this event. Mr. Fiaz Mughal is the founder and advisor of Faith Matters, a non-governmental organization focusing on education, civic engagement, leadership development, and community cohesion at local, national, and international levels. Based in the United Kingdom, Fiaz is also involved in many initiatives that have included social policy lobbying, project and general management and conflict res resolution work. Fia served as a trustee of the Holocaust Memorial Day Trust for six years. In June 2009, Fia Fiaz was honored by Her Majesty the Queen with the bestowal of the honor of the Order of the British Empire. Dr. Robert Rosette is senior historian in the International Institute for Holocaust Research at Yad Vashem. Dr. Rosette has authored and edited scholarly books and articles pertaining to the Holocaust and has lectured widely around the world. Dr. Joel Zissenwein is a Holocaust historian and serves as the director of the Righteous Among the Nations Department at Yad Vashem. Ruti Mandil Khalabi is the director of Studio Gavra, a photography school founded by her father, the late Gavra Mandil, about whom we will be talking during this discussion. Now, before we start the discussion, I'd like just to inform you that the chat function is open for writing in order for you to send us questions, some of which will be referred to our uh, panelists later in the discussion. Our first question is to Fiaz Mughal. Fiaz, what motivated you to establish Faith Matters and focus on the actions of Muslim righteous among the nations as recognized by Yad Vashem? Thank you very much, Yossi. It's a, it's a real honor to, uh, to be here today and uh, to share this platform with such esteemed speakers. Um, if I can start off by saying that the, uh, I set up Faith Matters in 2005, and uh, it came about because I, I, around 2002, 2003, I was um, then a councillor, an elected municipal member in, in Oxford. And I remember that there was, a, there was a strife in the Middle East 
Gaza and Israel issues going on and, 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 and conflict happening. And basically, I, I remember that um, the, the smaller Jewish community, the very small Jewish community in Oxford, felt pretty embattled and felt really, um, really, really kind of focused upon in relation to uh, a crisis that was happening two and a half, three thousand miles away. And so when, when I had a discussion with them, I, I really empathized and I, and I and I engaged with the local Jewish community to, to, kind of, to kind of feel that actually, hold on, we as minorities in, in the UK should be standing with each other at this moment in time rather than trying to split each other apart. And so that led me on a journey, that, that initial uh, trigger, that initial event led me on a journey where I started to look more into um, issues around Jewish history, um, issues around the Holocaust, because also I, as a, a member of a minority community, a, a British Muslim community in a place like Oxford in 2003, I, I felt that I wanted to connect with other communities. This diversity of communities was for me very important. It was a personal thing. And it, that journey led me to the development of Faith Matters, which was basically based on the foundations of Muslim-Jewish dialogue. And so it was Muslim-Jewish dialogue that formed the foundations of, of Faith Matters. And in that process, um, I've always had a strong connection. I've always, I've always called it an umbilical connection with Jewish communities, a very strong umbilical connection, spiritually, personally, historically. And the, the history of the Holocaust also shaped my education and understanding because I was interested in it. Uh, and in doing so, I always used to think to myself, I remember in 2003, 2004, where are the stories of Muslims who saved Jews in the Holocaust? I would always say that to myself because it was a good way to engage with communities to make them learn about the Holocaust. I heard nothing about Muslim stories when I thought to myself, hold on, across from Egypt, Tunisia, Morocco, there's this whole swathe of land where the Nazis went through. There's a whole swathe where they went through, obviously, in Greece, um, uh, at that point, obviously, under Ottoman rule. So we've got all of Albania and all of these countries which have a, a effectively a Muslim majority, whether secular or not, Muslim majority countries where the, the Nazi persecution took place. But where are the stories of Muslims who saved Jews in the Holocaust? So that journey of asking the question led me to want to develop a booklet around 11 years ago where I traveled to Yad Vashem and, and asked them whether I could engage with them, use their stories. And it was my first engagement in Yad Vashem in Jerusalem uh, because actually I was so enthused to be able to, to, to find out, one, about the stories, two, to start to engage Muslim communities in Britain to say, actually, this dynamic of the Middle East conflict, whatever your views on it, is not the overriding way we should look at each other as, as British Muslims and British Jews. And actually, three, that our history is so intertwined in many ways, but also has an intertwining with some cases of Muslims who saved Jews in the Holocaust. I didn't want to take away, and it's not about whitewashing history, I didn't want to take away for some difficult issues that took place in the Balkans around um, Muslim units in the SS. But I'm saying that all of this wasn't bad. There were good things that Muslims did. There were, as, as in any community, there are bad, there are good. But the good bits, those who saved Jews in the Holocaust, was never talked about. And so I just was, I was really focused on making Muslims know their history. Right? They needed to understand the pluralism of, of, of Muslim history, but also the pluralism of people who were Muslim may not have been religious, but there is a connection there when they save lives. So that's the driver. Those were the drivers of what led me to do that. And thankfully, things have changed. People are starting to learn. But 11, 12 years ago, it was a lonely space. It was pretty much me and another colleague, Ez Rosen, who wrote the book with me. Where, and he was, he was Jewish himself. And we just kept saying, we need to tell the world the history of what Yad Vashem has brought forward in the 70 plus righteous that it has. I think it's about 70, 80, around those figures. You may tell me different. But actually, these Muslims, which are documented by Yad Vashem, the world must know and Muslims must know. Thank you for that, Fiaz Mughal. Our next question is to Dr. Rob Rosette. Could you please provide us with historical insights about the Holocaust in Albania. Yes, thank you, Yossi, and welcome to my fellow panelists and everybody who's listening. A little bit of background about Albania. First about Albania, then Albania in this period, and then a little bit more, more directly about the Holocaust. Well, Albania was part of the Ottoman Empire until um, 1912, and during the First Balkan War in the autumn of 1912, it declared independence. In 1930, there was the first official religious census in Albania and it showed that there were about 50% of the population were Sunni Muslim, 20% Orthodox Christian, 20% Bektashi Muslim, and 10% as, as Catholics. 
So it was a predominantly Muslim country with also a large uh, Christian minority within it. All told, it was a small country, the population somewhat over 800,000 people at that time. I think another relevant thing to know because to understand how the country works is that it very much was influenced by clan. And there was the large Gags clan and they were in the north and the mountains and the Tosks and the plain in the south. And there was a clan structure. And in fact, when, when it became an independent country, there was not really a very strong central government until December of 1924 when Ahmed Zad took over. And then he was helped into power through what was then Yugoslavia, but something like a month after he came into power, he sent a letter to Benito Mussolini, the fascist leader who had recently come into power in Italy, declaring his allegiance to him. And in essence, Albania after 1925 was, you could more or less call it a vassal state of, of Italy in that period. And in 1928, Zog declared himself king, so it became a monarchy under King Zog. Italy invested deeply in the modernization of Albania. And between 1925 onwards through the, our period, something like 300,000 Italians settled in Albania. So they had a big presence. In April of 1939, Italy decided it was going to invade Albania because on the one hand, it was interested in the oil, but it was also interested in the Adriatic and, the, and also to keep up with Germany who was beginning to take territory as well. And they wanted to keep up with them. By spring of 1939, also many Albanians no longer were supporting their king. And so they offered very little resistance to the Italians. Zog fled to Greece and then to London. On April 12, 1939, the Albanian assembly voted. We don't know how, how uh, voluntary the vote was, but it did vote to offer the crown of Albania to the Italian King Victor Emmanuel. And so the country actually came into union with Italy. It was administered under the authority of the Italian Foreign Office until September 1943. And what happened in September 1943, some of you may know in Italian history that Mussolini was ousted in September of 1943. He would then be put back in by the Germans in what came to be known as the Salo government. But when he was ousted in September 1943, the Germans then moved into Albania. But they came into Albania not with a particularly strong hand. They did not set up a military government. The German forces stayed mostly on the Adriatic, on the Adriatic coast and were only inland when there was issues of fighting the various partisans that were there resisting what was going on. So they essentially kept Albania as an independent collaborationist government in this period, but even the government had little control outside of the capital of Tirana. There was German generals in charge of the area, Field Marshal um, Baron Maximilian von Weix was the head of the whole Southeastern Command. So nominally, he was in charge of Albania from the German point of view. They also had a very high diplomatic representative named Her Dr. Hermann Neubacher. Neither of them were in Albania. So the important people in Albania were the German consul, a man by the name of Schlieb, and also General Joseph Fitzhum, who was the commander of the SS um, in, in Albania. The Germans imposed controls only as much as the military system demanded, and that's important to know. They didn't come in with, a, again, with a really heavy hand here. So we have to understand that. They didn't take a lot from Albania because there was nothing to take. Albania had very much lost its economy and had been very much hit in the war itself. They did set up an SS unit in the area of Kosovo, which had been added to Albania in, in 1941. And the army, the frontier guard, the gendarmerie, and the police still remained under the Albanian government, but with German supervision. Germany left Albania in November of 1944, owing to the, what was going on in the war. So we can talk about this going on. Now, there was resistance, mostly under communists and some others fighting um, by 1941 onward. And eventually, the communists defeated the other resistance groups, the Germans left and they came into power of on November 29th, 1944. Now for Jews in Albania, there's a question of what was going on here too. There's no really exact and authoritative statistics about the Jews in Albania and exactly what happened to them statistically during the war years. But by 1937, it seems there were about 300 Jews in Albania itself and in Kosovo about another 500 were added in the spring of 1941. And also after the 
invasion of Yugoslavia, which occurred in the spring of 1941, Jews began fleeing as well. And Jews came to Albania from a number of places, Macedonia or today, Northern Macedonia, Northern Serbia. There were also some refugees that had come from Germany, Austria, and Poland. And so it was quite mixed. And nobody has exact numbers, but the range from 600 to maybe over 1,000 refugees that arrived. So the Jewish population in Albania during the Holocaust years was something between 1800 and maybe more because there has been some research done lately in archives in Albania that suggests from the names of people, there might've been up to 2,200 Jews in greater Albania during the period. Now there were anti-Jewish measures against the Jews on paper, at least the Italian legislation that had been passed um, in Italy was also put into place in Albania. It, the Italians said that Jews could not come into Albania, but obviously they didn't really stop Jews from coming in. Um, but they did order such things. And we heard from the ambassador that orders were given to hand over Jews later on and a list of Jews and the Albanians did not do that once the Germans came in either. Um, there was never a Jewish badge invoked in Albania. In Kosovo, things were harder and more and, and the Jewish community there was it much harder by, by, the Holocaust, um, by the Holocaust. Some of the Jews from Kosovo tried to come into Albania proper as well. And between them and other refugees under the Italians, there were some concentration camps set up. When the Germans came in, they were opened up. When the Germans then came in again, there were some attempts to round up Jews. It seems that they sent something between 250 and maybe up to 400 to Bergen-Belsen. Um, but the Jews in Albania proper, again, were not, um, were not persecuted beyond that to any great degree, but they were, they did go into hiding and they were helped by the local Albanians to evade again, the Germans and then the people working for them trying to, to round up Jews after the Germans came into power in 43. And we'll hear much more about that from my, my, uh, my friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Zissenwein. We don't have specific numbers. It's very hard to say of this 1800 to 2200 Jews in Albania, exactly how many died in the Holocaust. It's a very difficult thing to say. Several hundred, as we said, were, were deported to Bergen-Belsen and some others were probably killed in Albania itself, but, but we don't yet have good, hard and fast figures. And I prefer not to give any figures if I don't have them. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rosette. The next question is to Dr. Joel Zissenbein, the director of the Righteous Among the Nations Department at Yad Vashem. Joel, could you describe for us the principles and process of recognizing Righteous Among the Nations including examples of Albanians who have been recognized as righteous. Thank you and good evening. Um, okay, I'd like to start by um, a short introduction, limited time I have. Um, the term righteous among the nations originates from medieval Jewish uh, scripture. In Hebrew, it's pronounced chasidu motolam. It usually referred or was applied to non-Jews who stood by Jews at the time of uh, hardship. The term remained in use and it was actually applied by uh, Holocaust uh, victims during the Holocaust itself. We have several, we're familiar with several Holocaust era sources in which the term righteous among the nations was used. Generally it was applied to um, uh, rescuers of Jews. So it's interesting to see that already in what we call real time, this term was in use. Um, I don't know how many people, how many are familiar with the fact that the, um, the award righteous among the nations or the title righteous among the nations, um, is, uh, was included in Yad Vashem's initial tasks as they were um, detailed in the Yad Vashem law passed in the Israeli uh, parliament, the Knesset in 1953. This tells us that at a very early stage of uh, Holocaust commemoration in the, in the young state of Israel, there was already um, an understanding that one of the basic tasks of this uh, national authority for Holocaust commemoration would be to pay tribute to uh, rescuers of Jews during the Holocaust. Um, I should also say that the initiative or will to pay tribute and thank these people who risk their own lives to save Jews came from the survivors themselves. We're familiar with several cases in the, uh, I would say in the first decade of uh, the existence of the state of Israel in which um, survivors approached Yad Vashem requesting to begin this uh, process of thank you, of paying tribute and thanking their, their own rescuers. Um, the actual uh, program of, uh, right, of Righteous Among the Nations uh, was activated or was established in, the, in 1963. 
Um, the uh, award is given by a uh, public commission. It's an independent commission known as the uh, Commission for the Designation of the Righteous Among the Nations. Uh, it is headed by, it has always been headed by a uh, retired Supreme Court justice. Now that's important to understand uh, the actual process of uh, deciding and awarding an individual as a righteous among the nations is a semi-judicial process in the sense that um, it somewhat resembles a jury process as we were familiar with it in, I would say, the United States uh, legal system and the American legal system, where the commission somewhat serves as a jury and uh, they're, they're presented with evidence and afterwards the chairman of the commission actually um, approves their decision. Um, saying that also um, when someone submits or apply or hand or submits an application to award someone with the title righteous among the nations it is required to submit um, evidence mainly documentation and in particular uh, testimonies and firsthand accounts of survivors the recipients of help um, it's important to hear their version of the events um, it's not enough to hear the version of the uh, alleged rescuers. It's important also to hear the version of the uh, recipients of help. Sometimes there are uh, discrepancies and differences between the two versions, and it's essential for this process to receive the testimony of the survivors. Um, the, the program has been in, in existence since uh, the early 1960s. And up to uh, 2020, so far, 27, 000, approximately 27,000 individuals have been recognized as righteous among the nations. Uh, people sometimes wonder, is the program still in existence? The answer is yes. Um, interestingly, even in recent years, we still uh, have received, we've still received a, quite a large number of applications. They sometimes come from either from the uh, survivors and their descendants and, and sometimes from uh, descendants of the actual of the actual rescuers. So it's interesting to see that even 80 years from, or so after the uh, end of the Holocaust, we were still receiving um, applications and requests to award uh, various individuals from all across Europe and the Mediterranean as uh, righteous among the nations. Um, since we're talking about Albania, since we're talking about Albania, excuse me. Um, the uh, number of uh, Righteous Among the Nations that have been awarded and recognized by Yad Vashem is 75. Uh, the majority of them were Muslims, some were also Christians. I'll just, uh, several examples, um, uh, Basim and Aisha Kadiu, I hope I'm pronouncing it uh, correctly, um, rescued a, uh, a, a, a two siblings from originally from Greece, the Batinu family. Uh, they provided them shelter between 1943 and 1944. Um, after the after the war, um, they left to Israel and um, eventually submitted testimonies to uh, the commission in the early 1990s, and they were recognized. I should say that uh, as this might have been mentioned by my colleague Rob Rosette. Um, the majority of cases of Albanians recognized uh, as righteous among the nations took place in the 1990s. Uh, mainly uh, referring to events that or rescue actions that took place in uh, as of 1943 and onwards. Um, I'm sure we'll hear from uh, Ruthie Mandil in a second a few more details of her own family experience. But generally speaking, what we have here are uh, uh, quite a few cases in which Jews fled to rural rural areas and particularly various small villages and were uh, sheltered by the locals. Um, that's, uh, th this is the case of uh, Albania, which is in, indeed quite unique because we have here somewhat of kind of some kind of communal um, aid that we don't always see elsewhere. Um, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Zissimon. Our next question is to Ruti Mandil, whose family story we are highlighting today. Ruti, how do you relate to your family's special rescue story and your relationship with the Vesely family from Albania over the years? Thank you. First, I would say I'm really honored to be here in this panel and I'm uh, sorry for my uh, maybe poor English. <laughs> um, 
I will say that our connection with the Vesely family, which is our uh, the savior of our of my grand my father and my grandfather uh, family, uh, is not just an historical situation that was and is part of our past. It's really a, an emotional uh, experience. Uh, that feels that our destinies are connected. I don't know if, if everybody knows here, but the rescue story really begins uh, in the connection between uh, two photographers. Our, our family's uh, story goes through photography. That's why I think uh, the story is very good, uh, has very good um, um, evidence because the whole story uh, is, uh, pictured and uh, you can see that the, is, it, it's like a, a very big uh, project of uh, historical moments that um, the families took pictures uh, at uh, the specific uh, times. Um, my grandfather was a photographer in Yugoslavia and Drefik was a very young uh, guy, a 15 years old guy, uh, 15 years old. Um, that was the assistant of my grandfather's assistant. And the photography used to be uh, like a profession that goes in the family, like from, from one to another, like a magician teach his assistant all the magics. It wasn't something that you learn in a big school like today. And uh, to give these secrets to, to your uh, assistant is, is very deep uh, connection. Today, Refik's son, Refik is not alive anymore, and my father is not alive anymore, but uh, Refik's son is a photographer in Tirana, in Albania, and my father was a photographer also. He was one of the most uh, famous photographers in Israel. I am a photographer, and today I ran uh, Studio Gavra, which is with my brother, which today is a very uh, big photography school in Israel. Uh, and and uh, when we met the Vesselis in uh, Tirana, it was like um, really like uh, two families that get together after all these years. Uh, during the time that my father and Brefik were still alive, they kept in touch all the years. It's a story that I grew, grew up on. They sent letters, pictures, they knew about each other, life. Um, and my father really made uh, the recognition of the story into his life project until Rafik received the title of Right Among the Nations, Chasidum uh, Otolam. It was really something that was very important to my father. He done a lot to, to make it happen. Uh, when we all met all the families after my father was gone and Rafik wasn't alive anymore, but we met a few years ago in Albania the experience was very, very close. Like we, we meet, like it was our natural family. Like it, it's to meet our brothers and sister. And another small thing is that uh, Refik's grandson, which is a Muslim Albanian was named after Ron, my brother, which is an Israeli Jew. So as I said, it, it's not just something that belonged to the past and even not something that belong only to our families. It's more like uh, a symbolic, really a symbolic connection between the, the, the two nations. Thank you. Thank you, Ruti, for that very moving description of the connection between the families. For our next question, we return to Fiaz Mughal. Fiaz, from your experience, how do stories of righteous Muslims during the Holocaust, like the Vesely family, resonate today, especially in the UK? Well, I think uh, it, there's a lot of resonance. <clears throat> Let me explain a little bit why, some of the reasons why. Clearly, uh, the story and the history, and I'm really honored to hear that, Ruti, the history of your family, um, these stories have weight because they're people-to-people -people connections. All right, we as human beings will connect with other human beings. We have a natural affiliation to connect. Uh, unless that's manipulated, we naturally want to connect. So first of all, there's the people to people connection. I think second of all, um, there's been a strong history uh, of connection. Many times good between Jewish and Muslim communities, sometimes bad. We have to be honest and look at it. And the reality is the many times good gets overlooked. 
And there are many, many British Muslims today who have felt the pressure of global geopolitics, whether it's 9-11 and other things, who are looking for positive things around their identity, positive things around their identity. And stories like this give them hope. Stories like this give them a passion for life. Stories like this make them connect with other communities. And stories like this give them an empathy for Jewish communities who are very close religiously, historically, and in other ways to British Muslim and other Muslim communities. So there's a connection, but also, as I said, post all the geopolitics of a tough three, four decades that have buffeted Muslim communities, they, younger Muslims are looking for positive stories. They're looking for role models. They're looking for things that connect people, not politics of division. There's a change and we have to realize a positive global change that's taking place. And so I see these stories more important than they were 15 years ago, 10 years ago, when I was scratching around as one of the very few Muslims saying, why are we not talking about this? Let's go collect these stories. Let's talk to Yad Vashem. And actually I'm seeing a growing movement of young Muslims who are saying, I want something positive about my faith. I want hope over hate. I want opportunity of life and the defense of it over destruction of life. And I think these stories resonate deeply with those core human and core spiritual values which connect us as Muslims and Jews across the globe. And so there's a real openness today that I've, and I've worked 20, 25 years in communities, that I see an openness in British Muslim communities in sections of it that desperately want to know about this and feel a pride and a sense of connection in reclaiming bits of their history which are positive rather than the politicization, the division and the harm that we know just as poisonous to the globe right now. So I, I think we're into a good space and I think these stories just, we need to keep talking about them. We need to tell the world about Yad Vashem's centrality in that story. We need to talk about Ruti and her family and the fact that after three generations, and I'll finish off by saying this, that after three generations, they're in the same profession. Look, their life changed. Three generations changed. That they have a connection with Albania they have a connection with the family in Albania. And that all, all makes not just them stronger, but it makes us stronger and our families and our generations down the line stronger. Thanks for, us, for providing us with that encouraging perspective. Back to you, Ruti. A few years ago, you participated in a ceremony in Germany renaming a public school in Berlin after Rafik Vesely, who helped your family during the Holocaust. Could you please recount for us that moving event in Germany, as well as other initiatives that have been undertaken to highlight your family's story? Yeah, I, I couldn't uh, agree more uh, with Fiaz and his words. I feel exactly the same. And I wanna thank him for what he's doing. So yeah, six years ago, five years ago, I got an um, email from a school in Berlin, uh, a school where most of the students uh, are Muslims uh, and they were looking for a new name for the high school, uh, something that would inspire them. Um, they were exposed to our family story through Yad Vashem and the students, teenagers, all of them choose Refik Vesely's name to be the name of the call of the school. So the representative of the two families from Tel Aviv and from Tirana, from Israel and from Albania met five years ago uh, in Germany, this time on the German land, 70 years, 75 years later to tell our story. It was a very powerful moment for me, a kind of victory I remember myself speaking there at the opening um, and I was speaking about the, the victory of light over darkness. And mostly I think about the great power of education and of the possibility of choosing to be good. And actually the story is not over. It gives inspiration to all kinds of people. I, I think a lot, um, thanks to, to Yad Vashem for, for bringing this story to, to a lot of educational uh, places. 
Uh, I get emails and phone calls from different people um, once a week, once a month uh, from someone that wanted to write a children's book uh, recently from my father's point of view in order to make the Holocaust experience more accessible to children and to give them hope and to see that things can be also good even in the darkest moments in the history. And I can tell you there's even a thought of making a movie based on the family's story to give people hope because I think there's a lot of people that wanting to give hope and, and to use stories like that to give inspiration because if it happens once, it can happen again. And, and it's something that it's in our hand. And, and for sure, education is the most important thing. The, the first, um, the ambassador of Albania talked about the BESA, which is the ethic code that they were um, living by. And this makes the whole difference. Okay, if, if you choose something uh, that you believe in, you can change your life and others' life. And the, the, it's, it, 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 it never stops. It still has its influences today. So that was a very, very strong moment because it was with the Albanian family and because it was in Berlin. Thank you. Thank you. Uh Fias and Ruti, we're not finished here yet, but I'll, I'll say on behalf of the 300 or so people who are participating with us this, right now, um, this is really very encouraging and inspiring. Uh, and now we'll go over to some of those 300 people. Uh, we'll open up for some questions from the audience that have been posted on the chat by viewers. Of course, we can't relate to all the questions, but we are, are going to take some time for that interaction. And I'm pleased uh, for that purpose to call upon my Yad Vashem colleague, Rochelle Bud Kaplan, Director of International Relations and Projects of Yad Vashem School, who's also been very instrumental in initiating and putting together this event. Uh, Rochelle, can we hear from you and those questions? Good evening, good evening everyone. And uh, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, I'd like to um, start with one question that's been posed by Barry Kennedy. Thank you for coming. Barry asks us tonight, were any of the Jews of Libya deported by the Germans or saved by the local population? Perhaps Dr. Rosette could point out that uh, information or Dr. Zissenwein? Uh, um, I admit I'm not familiar with that. It's possible, but I'll, I'll put it this way. We don't have any records to the best of my knowledge in our department of such uh, actions, it doesn't mean that it didn't take place. It might mean that we just don't have uh, um, evidence of it. Um, that's the best answer I can give at the moment. I repeat again, if somebody has information, you are always welcome to submit it to our to the Department of the Righteous Among the Nations re uh, review. Um, that's the best response I can give at the moment. OK, our other question is, Someone has asked, can you point out some books on the Holocaust in Albania that we might want to recommend? Fias, perhaps you could uh, mention some of your publications? Um, yes, indeed. Uh, well, I'd, uh, I'm just going to flick this up here. This is free on the Faith Matters website. If you search for um, this booklet called The Role of Righteous Muslims, The Role of Righteous Muslims is basically a booklet that started me on this journey that um, Ez and myself uh, uh, drafted up uh, 11, 12 years ago. But there's The Righteous Amongst Nations as well. There was a book by um, Mr. Satloff, which, which was uh, about 10, 12 years ago, I came across it and it was Satloff's piece of work. And I'm happy to email anyone with the details. I can't remember the exact name of the book, but Mr. Satloff was the one who wrote about this, inspired by the impact sadly positively inspired by the negative impacts of 9-11, Robert Satloff said, actually, there's a history of Muslims and connection with Jewish communities and learning about the Holocaust that is an antidote to extremism. And he wrote about the righteous Muslims from Yad Vashem's work. And that is the first piece of work that I came across that I thought that's interesting. That led me to develop this, but also to, to, to lead my interest in this area. So Satloff's work is another good one, um, but there are increasingly small, pieces of work peppered around. And I think 
I just want to finish off by saying this, and it's a call to Muslim historians and call to fellow Muslims across the globe, if you are listening to this, is we need to be reclaiming any shred of the history that's not been reclaimed. The people are dying out, they're going. We are losing our own history. And I keep saying this to, to businessmen in the UK, Muslim ones, that they need to be funding work like this, working with Yad Vashem, working with NGOs, that capture every last scrap of evidence and capture it for posterity because we are losing the gold dust of our own history and the history of our connection with our closest religious allies. Thank you so much, Fiaz. Um, Rochelle Handelman is asking, Ruti, how was your family saved, especially your father and grandfather? Could you perhaps give us a few more details about how the family actually um, experienced everything there in Albania? Yeah. Um... Actually, they were they were living in Belgrade in Yugoslavia, but they had to run away when the Nazis came in, and they ran to um, to uh, sorry they were they were in Yugoslavia and they ran to Albania, and they were, actually they were for a few months they were hiding from one place to another uh, until they got uh, to uh, to understand that they have uh, to hide somewhere. And then by a coincidence, uh, my grandfather, which was a photographer, uh, saw a big photography shop uh, in, uh, in uh, the center of Tirana. And he went in and he saw uh, his assistant, as I said, that he used to teach a long time ago. And then he told him that they're a Jew and they must, um, must find a place to hide. And his assistant, which was Refik, was 15 years old, said, let me check something. I think uh, I can do something for you. And he went to his parents that lived in the, in the mountains in a small village um, called the Kuruya. And he asked them if they can hide the family. And they went through a few days uh, on um, donkeys, only through the night, so nobody can see them. Um, my grandfather, grandmother, my father and his little uh, sister, they were five years old and three years old. And they went through the mountains at night uh, for a few days until they go to Kruya in the mountains. And for a few years, they were hiding them. They changed their name to a Muslim's name. Instead of Mandil, they called Mendich. And instead of Gavra, he called Ibrahim or something like that. And they be became a part of the Muslim family, like they were their uh, brothers and sister, and they were hiding with them um, until the war was over. They really uh, lived like one family. And uh, the, the um, uh, Vesely's family, uh, all of them, all the brothers and sister, uh, had no doubt <laughs> of doing this. And um, they, sacrifice their life for that because if someone would find it, find them they will take them all over so they were they were hiding them for 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 a few years thank you very much ruti um fiaz the books you mentioned discuss uh, the specific rescuers names and details uh, is this educational material available for schools to obtain and if so how would they do that uh, could you please relate? I can also mention before Fia's ans uh, answers that we, of course, have a lot of information on Yad Vashem's website. You can find it, of course, at www.yadvashem.org. And of course, we have information about the righteous and many of the stories that you could be found there in that portal. Absolutely. And what an enormous amount of resource there is in Yad Vashem's website. And also, if people have the, the, the what can I say, spiritual opportunity to visit Yad Vashem in person. Um, the booklet we, that, that I've shown is, is, on the, is on the Faith Matters website. You can Google it, Righteous Muslims, Faith Matters, just punch in those words. It will take you to a free PDF and schools can use that. Uh, the booklet, they can download it for um, citizenship classes, for religious education studies, just as discussion points within, within uh, lessons. So that's available, but we also have and have had a, an exhibition that's been going around uh, various community centers, sometimes mosques, 
uh, educational centers, and sometimes just as a, a, as a community municipal showing of an exhibition, a series of exhibition boards that highlight the stories of Muslims who saved Jews in the Holocaust from Albania um, and, and other countries. So we put these on uh, educational boards and resources and put them in municipal, municipal spaces. And just to add that actually, we actually exported that exhibition into Europe. So that went into um, Belgium, it went into European countries and in Holland. And so that exhibition is still running from about five years ago in Holland with the stories of Muslims who saved Jews in the Holocaust. And the reason is there's a large uh, North African population in, in, in those countries. And so it is a way to inspire them to learn about the Holocaust, but it inspires them to learn about this or these sets of important human to human interactions. And it also inspires them as Muslims to say, actually, look, there is a positive part of our history in, in, a, in, a, in a world where we're all feeling quite disconnected well, we can connect with, that, with each other and connect with history. So there's the exhibition, there's this booklet, there's the Yad Vashem series of resources. And please, if anyone out there again, you know, I was moved when I went to Yad Vashem. I'm, I, when I go back to Israel, and I, and I will, I've uh, been there many times, I will go back again. I make it a point that I actually, I go to sites where the Holocaust is remembered because actually I find, I'll finish off with this, I find myself and parts of me in those spaces. So my call is, if you really want to know where you're from, particularly if you're a minority in majority countries, and you want to feel an empathy, you want to feel a connection, you want to know more about who you are, go to these places because it will develop and open your eyes. Well, unfortunately, we're not going to be able to get to all the questions this evening. And uh, I do just want to note a couple of comments from our viewers and for our audience this evening. I want to recognize the Welsh Muslim Cultural Foundation, who is with us this evening, who hosted a Righteous Muslim exhibition in January 2018. Uh, they thank Faith Matters for providing that uh, exhibition. Uh, we also, Yad Vashem has a um, ready to print exhibition, which can be also found uh, more information on our website. So certainly uh, we appreciate you mentioning that. And also uh, we have Mustafa Sarek Emeritus with us this evening from Belgrade. He's honored to let us know that they are opening the seventh forum for peace in Abu Dhabi uh, in this week, in which there'll be uh, many rabbis taking part. He says that this uh, important subject matter really is, should be part of the dialogue there uh, this week in the uh, United Arab Emirates. So um, we have other questions, but I think we will have to go back to Yossi uh, so that we can complete tonight's webinar. And again, thank you for joining us and for all of you who have written in the chat. We'll certainly be able to get back to you afterwards and into the week. Thank you. Thanks, Rochelle. We're going to conclude this event with one summary question. How can historic acts of moral courage, like those of the Muslim righteous among the nations, positively influence people in times and places that are distant from those original people and events. Fiaz, I think you've touched on this throughout this event, but perhaps you can sum up for us. What are your thoughts and your approaches to that central question? My approach to that central question is basically for people to look to places of history, to look to points of connectivity with other human beings and to understand that actually there is much that binds us and that institutions like Yad Vashem open up um, centers to who we are, to what makes us up. We're not, we're not singular identities. We're made up of many things. And I embrace these stories and I embrace Jewish communities and I embrace Jewish history because it makes me as a, as a Muslim, a stronger individual and a more connected individual to life and to liberty and to hope and to a future. Thank you very much. Um, as this memorable event that we have shared this past hour comes to a close, we would like to thank all of our panelists, including Ruti Mandil for sharing her family story and her own very inspiring approach to how that story continues to educate and um, move people forward in their connections with each other. 
Special thanks to Fiaz Mughal and Faith Matters for all that you do, both with us at Yad Vashem and in general beyond. We appreciate our cooperation with you very, very much. And we think it's both symbolic and instrumental for moving forward. Thanks to all of you, all you hundreds of people around the world who have joined us in this discussion. And we're sure and hopeful that you're going to continue with us, with Faith Matters, and in other contexts, in uh, dialogue and in constructive discussion between communities, between faiths, between people. We wish you, all of you and yours, good health, safety, and well being at this time, and a very happy holiday season. Thank you to you all. Shalom. Good evening. <laughs>